All right, y'all. Let's make some magic happen. We got this. <laughs> All right. I will I will start and then we will go through the motions and hopefully this will all hit where we want. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's career networking program hosted by the Lamette University Sustainability Network. My name is Sarah Cohen, and I'm from Alumni Engagement. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Before we begin, let me share a few logistical items. This evening's session is intended to help current students and young alums connect with Bearcats who are established in sustainability-oriented career, and I can't wait for you to meet our panelists. Please be sure that your microphone is, is muted during the presentation portion of this session. Now, I'd like to introduce our evening's host, Victoria Binning. Victoria is the brand new Water Quality Initiatives Coordinator for the Oregon Department of Agriculture. She is an alum from the CAS class of 2014, unabashed lover of organ trivia, and two-time AmeriCorps alum. Victoria is a food systems thinker and has a diverse background in community gardens, farming, winemaking, sales, and agricultural extension. Her own rare year from 2015 to 2016 was spent on the Southern Oregon coast, getting to the root of challenges facing local seafood and the small boat fishing industry where she learned that land-based food systems don't directly translate to the ocean. Victoria is a leader and key organizer for the alumni affinity group, Lamont University Sustainability Network. Thank you so much, Victoria, for hosting us this evening. And thank you so much for such a great intro. Thank you for that. Um, and before I dive in, um, I am going to um, read our land acknowledgement. Um, so welcome. We are gathered digitally or you know uh eric and i are here <laughs> physically um on the land of the kalapuya who today are represented by the confederated tribes of the grand ronde and the confederated tribes of the Celeste indians whose relationship with this land continues to this day and we offer gratitude for the land itself for those who have stewarded it for generations and for the opportunity to study learn work and be in community on this land um, we also acknowledge that our university's history is fundamentally tied to the first violent colonial developments in the Willamette Valley. And finally, we respectfully acknowledge and honor past, present, and future Indigenous students of Willamette. Um, so as we consider the content of today's presentation and our alumni panel, please consider your own positionality and how to take today's lessons to honor those negatively impacted by history similar to our university. Um, and as Sarah mentioned uh, earlier, this event is hosted by Lamb University Sustainability Network. Um, and our network is an affinity group of Willamette graduates, staff, faculty, and current students interested in sustainability related issues or who work in sustainability related fields. As sustainability is loosely defined. Um, many of the alumni who engage, um, they engage to primarily build connections, share resources, and advocate for change because not for ourselves alone are we born. <laughs> <laughs> um, and anyone interested in participating at any level is welcome to join our network. We do not discriminate against any, uh, any kind of sustainability. We welcome you to our fold. So you can, um, where can you find us? Actually, I don't know where to find us. It used to be WooConnect, but I hear we're transitioning to LinkedIn. So maybe Sarah, you can, you can jump in and tell us where we can find Woosin nowadays. <laughs> LinkedIn is coming soon. We'll have a group coming soon. Okay. Yes, for folks who haven't heard uh, Eric mumbling in the corner, so sorry, uh, we are transitioning slowly to new platforms. Uh, make sure to stay on the lookout for information from alumni and parent engagement and university relations in the coming months. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm very excited for the LinkedIn transition. Can't wait for all the reactions. Um, so, um, we are very excited for tonight's event um, and I feeling a lot of gratitude for tonight's panelists um, who did a great job of um, creating their slides for today, but also doing great things out in the world. And I can't wait for you to hear about it. Um, so what I'm going to do is have each of our panelists introduce themselves um, and then um, uh, what I would love to hear from you all is your name, your pronouns, your class year, what you're doing now. Um, we'd love to hear a brief overview of your career trajectory, a sentence or two about your current role, um, 
And then we're gonna take questions from our audience. And we have one pre-populated, so watch out. Um, but as you all in our webinar audience are listening, I s encourage you to be thinking about, um, you know, how does that, how does what that person is talking about connect to what I'm doing? Um, how did they even get there? You know, maybe you're a current student or a recent alum and you're thinking, my goodness, I don't know how to get into such a position. Um, and so I encourage you to be writing them down and thinking thinking them through. Um, what I'd like to do is have um, is to have everyone go through their introductions. Um, and if you um, have a question, we'll get to them at the end. Um, yeah, let's do it that way. So we'll start with Caitlin. Caitlin, are you are you ready and willing to go first? I am ready and willing. And Sarah, if you want, yeah, if you want to go to that side, perfect. Um, so Caitlin Horsley, nice to meet you all. I actually have two degrees from Willamette. I'm a two-timer. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree in economics back in 2009. And then I went back about a decade later and got my MBA here at the Portland campus. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But before I do, um, I will speak about my current position and then, you know, sort of how I got here, like Victoria said. Uh, and then I don't, I put a picture on my slide. I don't know if everyone did, but I do want to acknowledge it before I dive in. It's a jungle gym. And I think you know, when I think back to being an early graduate and looking at people's career trajectories or sitting down with people, I did a lot of informational interviews, which I highly suggest doing to figure out what you're really interested about. Like Victoria mentioned, sustainability can be very broadly defined uh, and ESG, which is the field that I am in. Uh, so doing those helps, but hearing their stories felt like it was a ladder, you know, like it was this really straight trajectory into these wonderful positions that I wanted to get to. And being where I am now and throughout this experience, I would really say it's more like a jungle gym and, you know, opportunities come out of uh, places you wouldn't expect, or you might take a role that doesn't work well. And so you jump from that one to another one that maybe you didn't expect to take, um, but just knowing that that's okay. So Please keep that in mind as I talk through this very linear looking journey <laughs> and know that it wasn't like that. And I'll give some anecdotes uh, that will help paint that picture as well. So I'm currently a senior manager of environmental social governance or ESG is what I will refer to it as uh, for F5 Inc. So F5 is a cybersecurity company. So we are in the tech realm. Uh, I have not spent my whole career in tech, but actually just recently came into it. But bringing my sustainability expertise has been extremely helpful in getting this role in a tech company. And I'll just give a little bit of context to ESG, although I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. I would say ESG is really the way that investors talk about sustainability. And so, you know, a company like mine, we transitioned from being a sustainability team to being an ESG team. So we could really align our efforts in the best way possible for our investors being a public company. So that probably also gives you some clues that I am really in the field of corporate sustainability and have been for over a decade now, which is um, surprising to me and probably just makes me sound old to everyone else, but <laughs> uh, it's been a great decade because sustainability and ESG has really just garnered so much more support. And, um, you know, I, I never really would have dreamed that the sustainability profession would be where it is now versus when I graduated from undergrad. I can see some nods from Laura and others too. So um, it's such a great time to be a sustainability professional. I'm so glad that we made it here. Uh, so prior to coming, yes, to uh, F5, I, I cut a couple out here because it's a fairly long list. And that is an example of the jungle gym, right? I, I jumped around jobs and that was a personal choice that I knew I really wanted to find the right fit for me where I was going to get the right experience. And not everyone will have to do that. Um, but actually prior to F5, I went and did consulting for six months to see what that was like. I was really interested. I worked in commercial real estate. Um, and although it was okay, um, it wasn't the right fit for me. And luckily I got uh, 
recruited into the current role that I'm in doing in-house sustainability is what we call it or in-house ESG. Um, and this is where I'm meant to be. The way that I knew that was I worked for PGE. So that's uh, the largest electric utility here in Oregon running their sustainability and ESG. Uh, for the first couple of years, I was sustainability manager and then went into the strategy department and managed their ESG and sustainability strategy. And that's where I really found out how much I enjoyed working across the business. That's a lot of what I do. So I work heavily with facilities. I was just uh, speaking with Lauren about fleet and fleet electrification with finance, with accounting, with supply chain. I mean, basically every department, HR, you end up working with as a corporate sustainability professional. Um, so number one, make sure you like the idea of that. And number two, that's definitely a skill to work on to make sure you can be successful in a role like this. Um, and prior to going to PGE, I worked in the home building realm. So I worked for the Home Building Association of Metro Portland. Um, that was a definitely a very different type of role, but I got a lot of great experience out of it. A lot of events uh, was what I did, which is not necessarily what I thought I'd be doing as a sustainability professional. But like I said, jungle gym, I'm just going to keep throwing it back to the, <laughs> the analogy of the jungle gym. You never really know. Uh, what you'll be doing. So uh, prior to that, um, I was an AmeriCorps volunteer as well. Victoria, yay. And um, I feel really lucky. I had a wonderful AmeriCorps placement. I worked for Prosper Portland. I learned a ton working for their economic opportunity initiative with low-income micro enterprises in Portland. And that's actually where I got interested in sustainability. Unlike you all, I didn't know as early as you. I wish I did. But then when I started working with small businesses and I asked them what they needed and they said, we want a sustainability program so we can really capture that market. Um, that's what I had a year to figure that out. So highly recommend AmeriCorps, especially when, you know, economic times are not great, which they weren't for me either graduating uh, with my undergrad degree. So um, yeah, shout out to AmeriCorps. And then as far as Willamette, I already mentioned, I got my bachelor's in economics in 2009. And then I did wait a decade to go back for my MBA. I thought about doing the 3-2 program. I'm not sure if that still exists, but um, I'm actually glad that I didn't. And I know that's not everyone's um, opinion, but for me, going back to get my MBA with so much work experience was hugely beneficial. Um, the things that I was doing in my MBA program, my capstone, I took directly to PGE and was able to make immediate changes and improvements to their sustainability and ESG program going through that program. So the MBA program, sorry. So um, I highly recommend that. If anyone has questions, please let me know and we can talk offline. I'm happy to do that. And some of my favorite experiences uh, while at Willamette and undergrad specifically was my study abroad in Ecuador. And I was on dance team and a member of Pi Beta Phi, which I think sadly does, is not there anymore. But <laughs> if anyone was in Pi Phi, let me know. <laughs> and oh my I goodness, that's, that's news to me. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, I love your jungle gym analogy, Kaylin. That is so appropriate. And also just, I think, especially hearing it from folks who um, are, oh gosh, more than a decade out, but have the prestige of an MBA and a career to hear that it is kind of a wild ride and it's all over the place. It's, it's comforting. <laughs> and as someone who's also been on a wild ride, I hear you. I'm right there with you. Um, but and to your point about being, having a degree in economics and then coming to sustainability, we're happy you're here. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to go to Lauren next. So for all of you listening, if you had little light bulbs go off when Caitlin was talking, please write them down. Make sure you capture them so that we don't get lost. Um, but we will go to Lauren next. Thank you. 
Um, so a little bit about um, a little, oh wait, oh yeah, a little bit, I was like, that's not me, I'm not that impressive. Uh, no, um, we, I'll go a little bit backwards because I do want to chat a little bit about, about my Willamette experience first. Um, so in my undergraduate, I, I studied economics like Caitlin. Um, to Caitlin's point, I did, I did pursue the three, two, and to anyone listening, um, to, again, to Caitlin's point, there's a lot of caveats. I think for me at the time, it was great, but there's also still a lot of moments that, um, there's a lot of moments that I itch to get back in a classroom now to reapply certain experiences and reapply certain, um, learning opportunities. Um, and you know, a great detail about, well, I might be outdated is the Willamette for Life program that they have attached. I don't know if at this point it's beyond Portland and Salem, um, but I know that that is a great avenue to go. Um, but again, to Caitlin's point, an MBA is not something to rush into or run into. And sometimes that three, two can, um, can, can lead to that. Um, so with that being said, again, um, I had a great, I had a great experience um, in my undergraduate experience, um, I went on on campus. I was very active in Delta Gamma, another sorority that is no longer on campus, um, and was active on the um, panel and a council. Um, a specific work experience when at Willamette that actually I was able to apply right away. And again, this is another advice to any current students is um, in that first resume that you're uh, building, is really applying everything everything you learned on campus and how you can apply that in a workplace. Um, at, as um, I loved my job in Telefund, um, really learning how to be comfortable on the phone, be learning how to take no, ex, hear no over and over and over again and celebrate our wins. Um, also is a great opportunity to learn how to we're gonna learn how to work in a workplace um, and manage and lead a team, um, whatever that may look like. Um, so again, highly recommend um, those types of positions while on campus, because I think that that really helped um, position me well when I was searching for a job. Um, and again, when you're coming really green out of school, it's hard to market yourself and it's hard to sell yourself. To, again, I, I feel like I'm mimicking Caitlin, but to Caitlin's point, it's a jungle gym. It's a wild ride. Um, and most importantly, the best resume advice I heard very early in my career is not only rewrite your, your resume or cover letter for every position, but highlight what you want to do. Don't just highlight what you can do because that will also that could ultimately lead to constantly running from rather than running to. Um, so again, that was a really that was great advice that I learned from um, my telephone, the telephone manager when I was a student that kind of really helped to build a strong backbone in that creation. Um, so out of school, I moved up to Seattle. Um, I joined a boutique, um, staffing agency, primarily supporting the tech environment of Seattle, where I worked as an agency recruiter. Um, really not a lot of pay, long hours, but a really, really great learning experience and learning learning how kind of the tech world worked works as well as other sectors. Specifically in that role, I had found myself niching um, towards green tech and public health. Um, and then I was ultimately picked up by a client to um, to serve as their HR generalist. Um, that was at the time about a fifty person um, fifty person HVAC optimization shop. Uh, and I was again very fortunate to be able to apply a lot of the lessons learned from Willamette um, to be able to serve in such a um, impact driven organization at that stage of my career. From there, I was able to transition um, to Comagine Health, um, which is there. Uh, actually, they have a location in Portland, if that rings any bells, um, formerly known as Health Insight, um, where they, we did, um, or we do, or we did, what I, I did, <laughs> supporting HR for a um, 
We're a public health consulting firm supporting everything from state Medicaid expansion to specific publicly funded or nonprofit driven healthcare initiatives. A, a, to a little bit too, a little more than two years ago, um, I was very, very burnt out from health, healthcare, uh, as I'm sure you all can look back at a calendar of what was going on. And I transitioned back into green, into um, sustainability, and was fortunate to um, be the first HR hire at One Energy Renewables. Uh, One, Energy, <laughs> One Energy Renewables is a um, national solar developer. Um, and we develop, we develop, own, and operate solar um, commercial grade solar sites throughout the United States. We have offices in Portland, Seattle, Madison, Wisconsin. That's for another story, uh, as well as Boulder and DC. Uh, so, and that has been an incredible wild ride. Um, it's again to what a lot of folks have said. Now is an incredible time to be a job searcher. And sustainability, we there is incredible opportunities across. And again, um, you, I again, I studied economics. I barely made it through bio for non majors, but there are so many ways to um, apply yourself in sustainability in the sustainable workforce without that sciency um, background. That wasn't me. It's not my strong suit. Um, but I was very fortunate to be able to find my niche and find my way to support the movement towards a um, a clean energy grid. It's very, I'm very fortunate to be able to work, to be able to support and lead a workplace that is committed to transitioning us from fossil fuels. Uh, and it's really, again, very, very exciting time. Um, and the big pitch I do want to give that's a little shameless is an organization that's become really near and dear to me that I definitely think Willamette should have some form of um, connection with is the Women in Renewable in Industries and Sustainable Energy. They are national, they're national, but they do have a very strong presence in both Seattle and Portland. Um, and specifically, it's a really great opportunity for individuals to network. And, and it specifically targets ensuring that we're building an industry of people that is pulling everyone in, along the ride. Um, and so with that being said, I will go ahead and pass it from there. Again, my apologies for my little toddler. <laughs> All part of the ride, right? Um, I love that so much. Thank you, Laura. And two economics majors who have found their their way into the sustainability realm. Hooray. Um, I loved your note about transferable skills, you know, and really highlighting what you want to do. I got sort of the opposite bit of advice at some point, which is like, if you don't like doing something, do not put it on your resume. If you hate grant writing, don't say you can write a grant because then someone will hire you to do it. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I love that you found your niche through, um, through the like, HR perspective and you're in the renewable energy field, but by helping the people who are making renewable energy possible. Um, and I think that's truly a lesson that I wish that I had heard when I was an undergrad, which is like, it doesn't, you know, cover your ears, Willamette admin, but like, it doesn't really matter what your degree is in, it matters what you want to do and how you apply that and how you use your critical thinking skills and your, I mean, Willamette grads truly have some amazing critical thinking skills and are truly great writers. So um, that is what we are bringing into the workplace and you can figure out how to do whatever you want to do. Um, so I'll get off my little soapbox and we will transition to talking to Lauren um, about her, her trajectory. Hi everyone, uh, Lauren Clemens. I am the third economics <laughs> major on this panel. Um, yeah, so I graduated from Willamette with my degree in economics in 15. Uh, my minor was in environmental science. And I think the entire time I was at Willamette, I was kind of trying to create my own sustainability major in a way, but that wasn't a major option at the time. So I took a lot of like environmental economics, environmental ethics, environmental science, anything that had environmental in the course title. Um, I kind of was trying to match my interests in environmental protection and then also just passion for economics and understanding why things happen and why people respond to different incentive structures. So 
Um, while I was at Willamette, um, I had a couple of internships. I spent one summer at the Department of Revenue just looking at tax structures and other like more maybe traditional economics um, experience. And then I also spent some time at a nonprofit in Tacoma called Earth Economics. And they were looking at how to value ecosystem services. So the, you know, positive benefits that the environment provides, how we can take that into account in cost benefit assessments. So um, my senior year, I did my thesis. I managed a project about reusing materials in the manufacturing process and invited some companies on a panel for that. And I think that whole process just made me realize that at the time I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do for a career. I ended up applying for grad school. So I did go immediately after graduating, which as others have mentioned, there's pros and cons to that. But um, I got my master's in public affairs at Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs, which is a fantastic program and has a lot of different opportunities for concentrations, one of which was in sustainability. But I was also trying to supplement, I think, some of the soft skills I got at Williamette with some other things like statistics and policy analysis and things like that. So um, while I was getting my master's, I was also just learning how to do project management, which I think is important in any sustainability job is being able to take something that's usually a pretty vague problem and break that down into steps and learn how to tackle that and rely on your intuition about what should happen next. I graduated um, and the job market for sustainability wasn't great. The federal administration had just changed. And so the sort of green job boom that I was hoping to tap into wasn't really evident in the first months when I was applying. And so there was some frustration there and unrealistic expectations on my part about how long it would take to get a job and what kind of jobs would be available at the point that I graduated. I ended up um, working a job more related to community development for a nonprofit for about a year and a half. And that role, I think, was really important because it was sustainability from a different perspective. So working in rural communities and Indiana. And um, technically, I was working on quality of life improvements, but for a lot of places, that was just another way to talk about sustainability or multimodal transportation in a way that was more accessible for those communities. Um, and some of the skills that I learned in that role that I think are important were just, you know, grant management, learning about contracts, working with consultants. Um, and then a job came open in the city that I was living, Bloomington, um, for to act as a assistant director of sustainability. And that was a primary sustainability role at that community. Um, and so I spent four years there. During that time, I was a project manager for the state's first climate action plan and worked to implement about four different programs. One was a solar lending program that we started. Another was to support nonprofits to do energy efficiency and solar improvements. We also worked with commercial kitchens on composting and then started a, an outreach program with um, neighborhood associations to get different projects started across the city. So um, that really gave me experience in looking at climate and sustainability from the city lens, which was really important because there was a gap in leadership at the state and federal level that was important for cities to be filling, especially at that point in time. I transitioned into my current role, which um, I am now the first climate action manager for Whatcom County, Washington. And if you're not sure where that is, it's just north of the Canadian border. I live in Bellingham. And um, speaking of jobs that aren't very well defined at the time, uh, they had hired me and said, here's this, you know, climate action plan, figure out what's prioritized and what to do next. So I've been spending the last seven months working on what we should do to reduce emissions related to local government operations, and then also to just work with different jurisdictions in our county to figure out some programs to start, not only for things like 
vehicle electrification, but there's a lot of other federal and state opportunities right now, just for climate action planning, for, you know, building capacity around environmental resilience. This, I live in a county that has a lot of federal and state forest land, and so we're looking at opportunities for carbon sequestration through different forest projects. Um, and so it's been wonderful to also get the county perspective. And so um, I am in local government right now because I'm, I feel like I'm at the closest place that I can be to solving some of the problems that we're facing. But there's also just a ton of great opportunities if you're interested in working for the state, Washington State in particular just started a carbon market. And so been collecting revenues that are being invested in climate projects. And there's a lot of hiring happening at the state level and then the federal level as well, as the recent administration has really amped up investments in different climate programs. So um, thanks for having me here today and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you so much, Lauren. I, I should have read my notes better. I didn't realize we had three economics grads. Amazing. I'll hold it down for my moral science. <laughs> um, but I I do love that you, you did a little bit of like figuring it out and trying things and testing the waters with internships because it's so important to figure out like, do I even like this? I don't know. I guess I'll try it out and see what happens. Um, but but figuring out what that actually is um, and then leaning into it, very impactful. And congratulations on your climate action manager position. That sounds like, one, it sounds like a lot of fun and a lot of responsibility. So way to go, you. <laughs> um, so we, um, we are in webinar format. So you will not be able to unmute yourself, dear attendee, and, and ask whatever questions that you want. But um, we do want to get your voice in the room. So I encourage you to hit send on whatever questions you were typing up as Caitlin and Laura and Lauren were speaking, because um, I would love to be able to ask them those questions. Um, and while you're doing that, we have one from um, a pre-populated question which is about biotech. And we do have corporate sustainability. We've got renewable energy and we've got um, sort of like city sustainability, municipal um, sustainability represented here. So I don't know that many of us can speak to um, the biotech field. The question is, can any of you speak about what the sustainability field looks like regarding biotechnology and the life sciences? And are there currently many jobs? So my question to you is, if anyone has biotech experience, please chime in. Um, and if no, I think a lot of people are thinking, you know, what am I going to do? Where am I going to get employed next? <laughs> so um, uh, uh, Laura and Lauren, you kind of like alluded to where there's growing spaces in this in the sectors that you're in, but I'd love to just hear tangibly about like what you're most excited about in terms of where your um, where your region is growing. So jump sure. on in, it's free for all. Okay. Um, <laughs> I would say that like every job can include aspects of sustainability and many companies are adding sustainability roles, biotech or otherwise. I mean, if you're looking at medical manufacturing, a lot of different companies need to meet their climate and sustainability roles. The community that I was living in I did a lot of vaccine manufacturing, but they had climate and sustainability staff that were looking at the supply chain and opportunities to reduce waste and um, so while I haven't been in any of those roles, I would just um, consider what sort of job titles you're searching for and whether those are descriptive of the ways that those types of jobs are labeled in those fields, which may be different than what you're expecting. You may not, if you type in sustainability, you might get what you're looking for or maybe not. And that's where I think, like someone had mentioned, informational interviews is really helpful. Um, not necessarily for the purpose of landing an internship, but just to understand what someone's role entails. Um, and then to what I'm excited for, I think um, the climate and sustainability space is kind of on supercharge right now, like even in states and different local governments that didn't have resources in the past, there is a large sense of urgency in terms of the federal government right now to 
um, get a lot of money out and that's causing action in areas that may not have happened before. And I think that's true also in, in the state and having some of this climate climate funding is, um, I think we're able to bring more people to the table, even if they don't currently have municipal climate staff, um, because there's actually funding for programs now. So um, I'm excited for that. It's also very overwhelming because a lot of the timelines associated are not necessarily realistic and <laughs> the capacity is not always there at the local level, but I do think it's been helpful to get more partners to the table. Awesome. Thank you for that. Caitlin and Laura, any um, anything exciting uh, growth opportunities where people might land a job in your sector? <laughs> yeah, um, I unfortunately do not know about biotech either, but I will, you know, sort of piggybacking on something I said earlier about all of the departments that I work with. That also means that there are popping up sustainability roles in all sorts of departments across business, right? So I mentioned finance. Um, when we talk about financial reporting now, we are folding in sustainability reporting. So I like when I worked at PGE, we hired someone to specifically work on our sustainability reporting who had experience in finance, who could, you know, who understood um, financial reporting from the federal level, SOCs, et cetera. So, you know, that's an example of where there's an emerging sustainability field that's in very high need. I also mentioned facilities. Facilities are very important. The company I currently work for, we lease all of our buildings. I'm working with our facilities department to get green leasing language into all of our leases so that the landlords are committing to, you know, working towards net zero or whatever it may be for that property, at least providing us data. So that's, you know, a facilities example. Um, well, supply chain. Supply chain is a huge area of development right now. So that's right. I work in tech. We do both hardware and software. But for our hardware, we have to source those parts from somewhere. So we have to work with all of these vendors. So anyone who's in supply chain could certainly go into a sustainability role within supply chain, also in high need now and will continue to be as we go more and more into scope three, which I won't go into those kind of terms, I promise, but that's the big driver of that. And you should be familiar with it if you want to go into supply chain sustainability. Um, but also just to that point, I think, you know, I mentioned that I tried out consulting for a little while. I think because of all of the funding and the new regulations and companies, organizations, I mean, municipalities are all sort of scrambling or not all, but a lot of us are scrambling to say, how do we do this? We need someone to come help us. So consulting can be a great way to get a job in sustainability and experience a lot of different types of projects. You also are basically a part of that company's team, your client. So you get an idea of what their culture is like in a way that you will not get through an interview. <laughs> uh, so I do recommend consulting at this point in time and sustainability because I think it could really get your foot in the door and get you some really valuable experience. And the last thing I'll say, because I'm sure Laura has some great things from an HR perspective as well, or clean energy, which I'm a clean energy champion as well, uh, is that, you know, we need everyone. This is a climate crisis. I'm not going to go down that road too much, but we need everyone's skills. We need sales. We need HR. We need, you know, we need all of it. And so, even though we all happen to be economics majors, <laughs> there is literally a place for everyone in this fight for the climate. So please don't let that keep you from jumping into this field. Thank you. I don't have too much to add. And again, I apologize. I don't have as much knowledge about working knowledge about biotech. What I can say is sort of echoing the other um, comments is there is a lot of there is a lot of rush and excitement from the municipal level to corporate level um, to build for sustainable infrastructure. What is that? That could look like a lot of different avenues. Um, in my world, that looks like solar and storage. And when I mean storage, that's specifically supporting. Um, storing clean energy to be able to apply to a fleet station 
like whatnot. Again, some another comment mentioned earlier today. So again, there's so much work being done right now, and don't um don't be afraid to apply apply in the ways that you can add value and you can um, solve problems. The biggest um the big the the most important quality that will uh, that employers will look for is willingness to solve a problem because that's why we're all doing this work um, and really po um, positioning yourself in that way. But again, to, to others points, my biggest suggestion um, again is right now there's a lot in solar, wind and um, storage. And again, that could look like a lot of different things. That could be the person who's calling landowners in the Midwest trying to lease their land so we can build a solar farm could also be the person processing accounts payable. It could also be the person who um, supports a front desk and making sure that everything goes in and out correctly. So again, things, it can look like a lot of different avenues, um, but really focusing on solving problems um, because that's what we're all trying to do together. Um, and I think another big, another big detail is once you fall in a position, not being afraid to continue to partner with places that may have rejected you. Uh, that's really, really hard to hear. and That's really, really hard to do. Uh, but again, I think the sustainable industry as a whole, we all recognize that we can't solve these problems on our own. Um, so with that being said, we're join those organizations and stay in contact and um, Keep those bridges as much as you can, because again, like you don't know what another opportunity or project could look like. And that's like legit advice coming from an HR professional. Okay. She knows what she's talking about. She's the one hiring. <laughs> um, and I would be remiss if I did not also add, um, Caitlin and I are both AmeriCorps alumna. Uh, and so there are so many opportunities within the AmeriCorps arena, particularly for folks like I came out of undergrad and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew I liked food and agriculture and I was riding that Xena farm high. So I wanted to do more of that. Um, and I jumped into an AmeriCorps program. And I think literally today, the Biden administration just launched the American Climate Corps. So that's exciting. Check that out. Um, there's a lot um, within that arena. And there's a lot cross cross industry too. Um, I think a lot about in my my world in the agriculture arena, you know, the renewable energy folks and the ag folks are trying to work together a lot. And now there's a, an electric tractor pilot in Oregon, um, figuring out how do we get, how do we electrify, electrify the farm fields? Um, I dare you to say that five times fast. Um, but Anyways, there's lots of things, but I'm not on the panel, I'm moderating. So I will keep us going. Um, and I would love to know, we have a great question here um, from someone who was really paying attention. Uh, they noted that some of our panelists, you all, transition between sustainability and non-sustainability positions. And they're curious to know if it was challenging to transition into sustainability positions um, and what you did to manage those challenges. I can start. Um, yes and no. So I think one of the benefits you have in moving into sustainability and climate work as a younger person is that there's not as many people walking around that can say that they have 40 years of experience in sustainability and climate work because as a field itself, it's evolved so much recently. So I think everyone's learning and things are changing constantly that it's you're building expertise iteratively and on different subjects. So I would often be thrown in situations when I started at the city where, you know, I didn't know that much on a given topic and I just had to go figure it out. And I think that skill was transferable between former former roles because you kind of just have to understand where your understanding or knowledge on that subject ends and what sort of resources to turn to to augment that so that you can bring more to the conversation next time or learn more about it. Um, and so that problem solving component, I really credit William it with helping me understand how to think through or consider problems. Um, and there are some things that you are going to need technical expertise in. I mean, things that I already mentioned, like greenhouse gas accounting, but 
I would say that if you're willing to learn and you are coming into a role that's supportive of a new employee, then you shouldn't be too concerned about that. So you're looking for somewhere that has a good sort of mentorship program, because as a young college graduate, like you shouldn't be expected to be an expert, but they need to have the ability to grow with you as you are able to take on more um, within that role. Any I thoughts from Kayla or you. Laura? No yeah. challenges for me too? <laughs> definitely challenges is not necessarily going out of and back into sustainability. I was lucky enough to keep, you know, like we said, sustainability can be pretty broadly defined. I was very energy focused in my sustainability career in the beginning and then went into commercial real estate and now tech. So changing industries definitely had its challenges, you know, to Lauren's point about having that specific expertise I've been learning different industries but that for me is the type of challenge that I really like and bringing my sustainability knowledge to that um so lucky for me that was not necessarily a challenge I will echo Lauren's comment about project management skills though that is a non-sustainability skill that I just happened to work for a company who did a free day-long project management training and that was one of the best trainings I've ever taken because like Lauren mentioned, sustainability, a lot of your job is taking, you know, sort of <laughs> ill-defined things. For instance, right now I'm setting our climate target for our company. That is not something that, you know, someone else has done at our company before that they can hand me a project plan or anything like that. But having those tools of, getting all of our key stakeholders in the beginning to sign on to what this is going to look like and what success looks like all the way through to the end and signing off on what we did is incredibly helpful to get through that sort of or any organizational rigmarole of getting work done and approved and funded that I would say is important anywhere you go. So big champion of project management, Although hot take, I don't know if it's worth doing the PMP training. I think just get some training. <laughs> well, maybe Laura can speak to that. Okay, I was wondering that, so I'm glad you said it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really hard. PMP, <laughs> the PMP can be really helpful depending on, it's more helpful the more stubborn you are. And PMP and I, for those uninitiated is project management program? Yep. Okay. Um, I would say that the PMP programs directly has been really important for those who may not do it themselves, but are required to do it to continue on a promotion path. Um, so it is that it is a real, it is like another shiny certification that is, is valuable, but is at the end of the day, your skills and what you're bringing to solve problems, that's more valuable. And being able to show for that success is ultimately more valuable than a few extra letters um but at the end of your name it's like that's the candid uh response to that uh that being said um i had a similar experience where i i and i'm i'm fortunate to have been able to make the transition back into st the green tech during a time of growth and change to other kind of echoing other points a natural, a, a natural quality of the culture of sustainability is humility and the awareness that we don't know everything. And that is why we are in the problem, that why we're experiencing the problems we currently have. So with that being said, they're transitioning in is not not as intimidating if you are able to find a role that you can directly apply yourself into um, is probably the, the the trickier part of making sure you're managing that transition. But I would say, again, the industry isn't as difficult, um, whereas more that role-specific application. Thank you so much for that. Thank you all for that. Um, I do want to address the question that uh, we got in the chat from Caroline about farming and sustainability, which is my wheelhouse. 
Um, so what I'll say there is, um, yay. Uh, but also if you are interested in farming sustainability, there's a whole bunch of things you can get into and sort of in the, the vein of what Caitlin and Lauren and Laura have been saying is like, it's really about what your skills are that you bring to the table. Like if you want to be out on a farm, by all means, like go work a farm season. There are so many small farms or large farms in the state of Oregon that take on seasonal workers and they would love to have you um, and train you up. And if you're feeling like, oh, I have no experience and I'd like to get trained, there's Rogue Farm Corps, which will literally, you can apprentice to become a farmer. Um, but many people like myself learn that you know, being alone in a field and weeding for hours is not where extroverts thrive. So you uh, take on other roles and you can be a convener. Um, I did an AmeriCorps program, which was uh, children's garden education at the Marion Folk Food Chair. Um, but there's a lot of network development. And I think for anything that you want to get into, finding the networks, just signing up for email chains and attending the quarterly meetings and figuring out who's who and what's what and what's going on and just getting abreast of who, like what are the things that are happening is very helpful. Um, and also I'm happy to draw my contact info into the chats so that you can figure out more about farming and sustainability because I'm happy to go there with you. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that we're somehow almost at 6 30 and that is when we have um we have scheduled our time together so to put a pin just like on what Caitlin and Lauren and Laura were all saying I think truly I'm really inspired by the three of you and the moving and shaking that you're doing and it's truly I think maybe Caitlin said this like it's wild to think that we're like 10 years away from graduation <laughs> how did that happen um but also incredibly inspiring that that there's this powerhouse lineup of ladies who are making things happen um, and are using their Willamette degrees to do it. Um, so thank you all. And I love the 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 message that you can have a background in whatever topic that you you would like, but it's about figuring out what works for you and how you can apply it and where to go because um, because we are in a climate crisis and we need you all. Well said. <laughs> so um thank you to Sarah for being our zoom wizard serious round of applause um it has been a joy to host with you uh running the behind the scenes uh and thank you to Willamette as well for providing all of the zoom and communication and infrastructure believe it or not I didn't send you those emails Willamette did thank you for putting my name on them. Um, but it has been a joy to uh, join you all and to learn more from Caitlin and Lauren and Laura. Um, thank you to our panelists for, for giving us this time because time is truly one of the most valuable things that we have to offer. And so I just want to thank all three of you for volunteering your time to be of service to the next generation of fair cats who are trying to figure out uh, the wild ride that is life. Um, and uh and thank you to eric as well for uh keeping the alumni station running and and rolling so uh an invitation to you all to join the willamette university sustainability network we are we're a fun alumni group we we hope you you stick around um but with that i will toss it over to sarah um and thank you all so much for joining sarah you are muted <laughs> <laughs> it gets us to the end uh but to reiterate much like what victoria was saying uh thank you all so much for uh, coming this evening and for those uh who are watching the recording afterwards uh, we hope that we got a lot out of it yes, hello thank you so much for coming uh to this recording uh and just a quick note on our end uh make sure to be on the lookout for a global Global Day of Service in the spring. We believe it'll be around April 13th and the two two weeks kind of surrounding April 13th is a great time to get out in the community and do community service. Uh, Wusun, Willamette University Sustainability Network often comes out and does a lot of things and make sure you use uh, hashtag Team Willamette if you're gonna mention any of the things you're doing during that. It will be a great way to see what folks are doing for their own climate activism, but Thank you all so much. We appreciate you for coming and we hope that you're all getting a lot of more information and pursuing your thoughts in sustainability careers. Once again, have a great night and we'll see you next time.